form of the model is, again, rather standard. These are atom-centered point polarizabilities, which I'm calling PPs here, where each polarizability is symbolized by alpha. Um, and I don't know whether folks are familiar with the direct approximation, but I'll just talk about it a little bit. So in your standard, if you have atom-centered point polarizabilities, so every atom has a polarizability, and there are charges on the atoms. So for every conformation, every point polarizability feels a field to do to all the other charges in the system. So it polarizes. But if you want to do it rigorously, there's a sense in which you should say, OK, I can't just compute those polarizations. Those now produce a field which affects all their friends and neighbors. So I have to recompute the polarizations in light of the initial round of polarizations. And then so you can iterate to self-consistency. There's a concept of a self-consistent polarizable force field, uh, which can also be solved by other methods than, than iteration. But that's the basic idea. But there's evidence, there's an idea that goes way back in the literature to at least um, the 90s, uh, Cherik Stratzma, using a direct approximation. I think that um, there's a paper from BJ's group using direct approximation for water even with you. That's what I thought. And um, a postdoc, a student who worked in our group, Amanda Lee, also tested this in a different context, that if you don't iterate, you just say the point polarizabilities polarize due to the permanent charges, and they don't feel each other. So they don't iterate to self-consistency. There's a sense in which you're making a model that isn't embodying all the physics, uh, but it's a whole lot faster, because that iteration, or solving that self-consistently, takes a lot of computer time. And there's evidence, uh, empirically, that you can actually do pretty well with it, this direct model, which is dramatically faster. So that's what we're going to shoot for with the possible, you know, being open to the possibility that we may want to go to um, something more uh, self-consistent. So there are less expensive models that now involve like taking two or three steps and extrapolating. I think Bernie Brooks had one, Teresa had okay, has another yeah, one. Solid, um, yeah. they, they solved this problem where previously Jay Ponder mm -hmm. had taken a limited number of steps initiating mm -hmm. with the previous right. polarizability and you get forces that are no longer the gradient of a potential. So it right. has no stat mech problems either. Mm -hmm. But that might be just a little bit more expensive but give you like 99% yeah. of all the polarization. Right. My recollection is that the direct model is a valid Hamiltonian. Oh, no, it is. It's yeah. perfectly fine as but well. Yeah, yeah. If you take a couple iterations, If you take a not... couple of iterations and you extrapolate to a, a then solution, okay, then yeah, it's, yeah. it's deterministic at least. That makes yeah. sense, yeah. Cool. Um, so the idea is that so we, what we need to do is for every non-hydrogen atom, presumably, or maybe we'll include hydrogens, the value of polarizability for atom I will be assigned. Uh, we'll have a polarizability that's going to be based on polarizability types. So we heard about atom types. Well, those are now Leonard Jones types, right? Let's say bond types. Torsion types, angle types, so here there'll be polarizability types, uh, which will need to be fitted, uh, and so forth. Um, and that typing will be able to use the Smirnoff Smirks machinery that you heard about this morning. Um, and I said basically, you know, for AM1, BCC, and REST, these are basically quantum based models where they haven't really been tuned to experiment. And they work quite well. Everybody sort of runs around and tunes everything else. So here we're going to say, well, if it works okay for the partial charges, Let's try it for the polarizabilities. So we're going to derive the polarizabilities from QM calculations. And I'll touch on how that uh, can be done. Again, it's not tremendously novel, just putting pieces together, hopefully in an efficient way. So to optimize these typed polarizabilities at all, did you have a question? Yeah. So when, when you said direct approximation is quite close, is it, uh, Cl okay. uh, is it in the context of like a full bulk, like solvent? Like, would that be the case in the water? So, I, so Li Ping will probably be able to say more about that than I, because there's a the water model, which was derived using the direct approximation. So, Somebody thinks it's a great idea. So, uh, but I think uh, Amanda's, Amanda's work doesn't go into that, because it wasn't condensed phase. Mm -hmm. so, um, I was, uh, is that your marker? marker? I think so. That's yeah. your marker. Jesus. <laughs> 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 Your phone's rebelling. It was actually one of who did that to me. <laughs> Thank you. What were you gonna say? Um, yeah, I, I was. Uh, um, so for the for the point dipole models, at least, and I think the Drew models also. There's the there, there's these like um, the the totally damping at short range, which mm -hmm. involves another parameter. And, right. and and what I was wondering is um, um, that um, it seems that at least looking in the amoeba model, the the, the totally parameters were much more pinned to the same value than the, 
of the alphas were. Yeah. Yes. Um, and and I was wondering if um, um, if uh, if Smirnoff has a has a, has, a, has, a, has an easy way to to account for that basically. You know when when you have say an alpha and a Tolley parameter, both of which are relevant for the same kind of interaction, but one might be more finely grained than, than, than another one. Would, in this case, would there be like a polarizability oh. type and a Tolle type, and they both need to be there? So if I, I think what the Tolle type has to do with screening of neighboring mm -hmm. polarizability, mm -hmm. so you don't get a polarization catastrophe where they one of them gets mm -hmm. a polarized anti-parallel. Um, I mean, in Amanda's stuff, we looked at this, and there's a paper from Chi Plak and others where they tried different, different screenings. None of it seemed to matter that much in our hands. Basically, we excluded the one twos, and I think we excluded one threes entirely. And then there just weren't that many close interactions. But, but with direct polarization, I don't think there is any catastrophe. Oh, yes, yeah, right. It's not there. You're right. Because um, they can't iterate if we ramp each other up. That, that you don't compute the interaction. You don't compute dipole <coughs> dipole. Right. Well, that's um, that's. That's true, but changing the Tolle parameter still does affect the properties. Is it does it apply between it charges and dipole and polarizabilities, or only between polarizabilities? Well, uh, it, it's so I don't know too much detail about it, but even if Tolle parameters may change the proper properties if you're including it, if you don't have a Tolle parameter at all, then you can just you know, just proceed. Straight ahead with your polarizabilities, I think. Mm -hmm. My my impression, you know, again, we haven't I haven't done a whole lot on this, but in the stuff that Amanda did in our lab, which was on small small molecules, where there were some atoms that were close enough and not mm -hmm. not bonded to each other, to that this could matter. It just didn't seem to matter that much. It was a whole lot. You could spend a lot of time on it, but and maybe it'll come back and bite us, and we'll have to deal with it. But my impression is it's not a huge deal. But I think what you're asking, if I if I may, is if you've got Polarizability types on your atoms. Do you do you want to have Tolle types on pairs or something <laughs> like that? I mean, it seems like that could be. It, it, would, it's, it would fit naturally. Yeah. It would be completely natural to, to separate those out. In fact, this is right. I think one of the great freedoms that we have mm -hmm. with our the structure of, of Smirnoff is that mm -hmm. if you want to just separate out, if, if, a, if a parameter can be simplified, mm -hmm. please do so. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the point I think you're making. Mm -hmm. The other point is, in, in John's point earlier, if we do proceed to some like three-step iterative with extrapolation, mm -hmm. where we want to get that extra 10%, then we would have the polarization catastrophe. Mm -hmm. We would be in danger of it anyway, right. so we probably need to go and take that route. Yeah. Well, there, I guess I'd be really, I'll be really curious to see how this whole business develops, because it's not entirely clear to me that iterative self-consistency Brings in that much better physics, you know. Well, maybe for long-range interactions it does, but the whole model is actually fairly weak. I mean, the idea that there are point polarizabilities on atoms is at least as weak as, um, you know, point charges. Mm -hmm. um, so the computers keep trying to embarrass me. <laughs> Hopefully, nothing bad will come up. Um, so, to step one, use Stone's distributed multipole analysis. What about it? For step one, do you use Stone's distributed multipole analysis to get the reference polarizabilities, or no? Okay, so the, so there's different ways of doing this. So we, we actually came up with uh, sort of three three approaches in order of increasing complexity. And model one is one that I think that Chris was particularly interested in, because in principle it might be possible to make it agnostic to the underlying charges. I see. So the way this works is that you do your quantum you have a training set of small molecules. You compute the electrostatic potentials around them by your favorite method in gas phase. Mm -hmm. You then put a bunch of probe charges around them, one at a time, polarize them, recompute the ESPs, mm -hmm. right? And then um, fit polarizabilities that will best replicate mm -hmm. those changes, but not try to not include the polarizabilities in fitting the underlying potentials, mm -hmm. but only fit to the differences. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could I please speak to that just for a moment? So, so this is what we did with EPIC. So Jean-Francois Truchon uh, was a graduate student of mine, and he developed a polarizability model, which was based entirely on using a dielectric continuum, like we normally think of for solvent response, but to do polarizabilities. Um, he did exactly this. He got just what, what Mike was laying out, 
to get essentially the um, electrostatic potential, the, the difference electrostatic potential, which reflected only the polarization response. Who knew what the right charge model would be underneath, right. or what any charge model was? You don't even know. But the dielectric response, you have that. So if you parameterize to just the dielectric response, you're completely independent of charge model. And I think the beauty of that for Smirnoff in general and for us, think of the first generation force field, second generation force field, fourth generation force field. I mean, whatever, however we improve our charge model, our underlying charge model, we could have a polarizability model which would be plug and play. The better our underlying charge model gets, the better the overall electrostatics gets. It's not dependent. That was the So that point number two is, is to me something that's really, really exciting about this. <clears throat> so, so I think we've sort of gone through points one through four. Um, I think there is a potential problem, which is that if you take your plug-and-play polarizabilities and you impose a different set of partial charges, right. you're going to generate, you're going to polarize it in a different way. And so you will modify your baseline ESP. Yes, uh, I, I was, if you're starting, but we have yes, these. Yes, Mike, you convinced me of uh, the better science. So, so <laughs> yeah, it, it is, you're right. But, it, but yeah, but there, there, we talked about some different ways of working around it. For example, if you exclude uh, short-range interactions. Anyway, there are a couple of possibilities. But ultimately, you, if, if it turns out to be problematic, if it distorts it too much, this is just not me doing it. Doing it. Essentially, you can make. <laughs> well, you've got some new updates. You, you can make charge yeah. model agnostic polarizabilities, go. but can you make polarizability agnostic charge models? And that's where I was initially thinking one could, and I'm I'm kind of hoping that maybe we could get away with it. But but might convince me that actually, rigorously speaking, we certainly would need to account for the polarizability component within a charge model to do the mm -hmm. proper job. Yeah, the, the, then the question is, yeah, how much is it going to matter? Right. And I think this is where it's a proposal. We don't quite know what's going to happen. Um, and this is an adaptation to that. This is now not charge agnostic. This is, let's start off with some tuned charges. Here the idea is that your initial charges would be, um, let's see, what does this mean? start off with charges that are basically tuned for vacuum phase. So in here, you instead of using 631G star, which overpolarizes, <laughs> you'd use a higher level of quantum that doesn't overpolarize, and you would essentially optimize your polarizabilities to give you decent ESPs in the presence of those charges. So it still has intramolecular polarization, but it's not right. being polarized externally. Right. Well, but it should... But the, the charges aren't backing out. Like, if you used Stone's DMA, you would get, get the bare charges before the... The polarization. Do you remember how this was going to work? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, imagine your base system with no polarizing field, yeah. some molecule, you got your ESPs, and then you've got, you know, three other potentials with probe charge in X, mm -hmm. probe charge in Y, probe, probe charge in Z. Okay? So in the, in the charge model agnostic method, you're always subtracting these potentials from those potentials. Mm -hmm. So you get the difference potential, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's the dielectric response. Yeah. In this model, this you'd, you'd fit directly. You'd say, I've got some, I got some charge model, which is going to give me charges, and I've got some polarizability parameters. So I'm going to simultaneously fit to you, these you SPs really as they are, here. Yeah. these ESPs as they are, these ESPs. I'm going to simultaneously fit to all four solutions. But you're but just fitting the polarizabilities, or are you fitting the charges? I think, I think and ultimately, the fitting ultimately, the you, have, too, ultimately yeah. you have to co-optimize them. I yeah, think yeah, that's, yeah. I think I think that's right. really where you have to go. Right. And so there, you would co-optimize the charges and the polarizabilities for um, vacuum phase unpolarized QM calculations and vacuum phase polarized QM calculations. You, you still need the polarized calculations because you're fitting the right. polarizabilities as well. What we showed worked with, if you do the charge model agnostic ones, you've used the information from the polarized ones to come up with the charge model agnostic ones, but still there's the dependence. So if you go back to your unpolarized set, because of the internal polarizations, you still have to put in your, your charge right. model agnostic polarizabilities, subtract off that effect, and then your charge model is what you fit to the <coughs> So the question is, do you do it simultaneously? Do yeah. you separate both steps? 
the benefit of combining the two, as Mike was suggesting, is that it, it surely must give you a better charge model, a better electrostatics in the end. Whereas with the agnostic model, your polarizabilities are more um, independent, but you're unlikely to get quite the same level of accuracy. Yeah, and I don't think there's any huge problem to doing this. We've done this essentially with small molecules. We fitted combined charges and polarizabilities without, without typing. Basically, we, the only typing we did was if you had a molecule where you had two atoms that were you know, chemically symmetric, so these are chemically yeah. symmetric, mm -hmm. we said that these had to have the, the same, same parameters. Yeah. But then it's, it's fairly straightforward to just optimize point charges and polarizabilities of these things together. But just, will the polarized calculations use waters for the polarizing effect, or would they use some other just test charge? I had been thinking of just using test charges. I don't that's know. what we used with that can work pretty well. I, I think it's OK. The, I think that these polarizations are really very linear. So I think that if you, you know, it's yeah, a superposition yeah, yeah. of whatever you put then out there. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah, at one point, we had been polarizing them with like unit charges. <laughs> and I said, oh my god, the whole thing is invalid. But, you know, that's like way too big. But on the other hand, you know, they're probably pretty linear. These are rather stiff systems. So we went to 0 0.1 charges, and yeah. it scaled by a factor of 0 0.1. Interesting. So I think that if you put waters, it's going to look an awful like the superposition of, you know, the three-point charges or whatever. And, and the test charges don't don't add extra basis functions. You just got to put them far enough away. Like there's just yeah. Well, I mean, we, it's a matter of judgment how far to put them. I think right. Yes, but it's about yeah. You know, but you know, it's, it's one over r. Like I, I'm, I was thinking that maybe at some point you could saturate the response and get artifacts if your charge was too big. But well, you could, I think. But I think we, you know, we were putting unit charges nearby yeah. in vacuum. And it wasn't saturated. Yeah, I, I think so. we were putting unit charges in too, but it yeah. could have been like four and we just didn't want to make right. sure we wanted to make sure it was way outside the tails right. of the, the basis function. So right. we put them a little distance away. There's an interesting reality check that you can do. This is actually if you look at work from Sheeplack, if I'm pronouncing it right, they'd actually derive polarizabilities without doing any quantum calculations. They based it on gas phase uh, experimental dipoles. Yes, the acid plus. Okay, yeah. And so, yeah, and so, I mean, you can take what we could do, what we did actually in the stuff that Amanda did, and you could do here is you could take your polarizabilities and do a reality check. What molecular polarizabilities do you get? And you can get fairly reasonable things. So, so in the Machiavellian scheming here, um, I'm thinking that it would be, you know, if this works out, we're talking, this would be like kind of a natural thing to think of for a generation three or, or, or advanced down in the generation two line of, of things. What do you envision the polarizability way of specifying things? Is it on a per atom basis? Or yeah. is it possible to ha have per fragments where you might want to say, if I see these, this like amid uh, moiety occurring together, I should have these polarizabilities? Well, I, I have, I have, um, <clears throat> I have uh, hope, faith, and a little bit of evidence. So my, um, my little bit of evidence is that with the, with the epic work that Jean-François Truchon did, we found that um, using the dielectric response uh, method, we only needed like atom and hybridization, and often we could get away with just uh, like element and But it was always single site. You never needed to say this group of atoms has this, we these polarized. We never found a case where we did. However, the if difference could... here that, that Mike was mentioning a couple of minutes ago is we're thinking of excluding the one the one two interactions and maybe the one threes as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. So in the dielectric continuum model, we didn't do that. And that could introduce fragment dependence because whatever that effect is that we're ignoring, would it begin to have some chemistry? But yeah. yeah, that sort of assumes that it's meaningful to talk about point dipole over here generating point dipole two hours away. I mean it's and maybe it'll just be. Yeah. Uh, I, I exactly. Think, we don't but, know. And that's the hope and faith part. But I, your question is whether you would put a single polarizability for a, a, an H, for a group. Is that what you're asking? I mean, no, that's, that's, that's definitely something that can happen. But, but no, it's, I, it's I, a, a group dependence. Like if, if, and you could still express it with single atom things where you just recognize the whole thing and say, I'm, I'm just asking operationally, like, would Smirnoff need to have the ability to say, I'm going to put, I'm going to recognize an amide bond, like yes, a peptide bond, and say the four atoms in that involved in that have these four polarizabilities. But we already have that, right? You know, that's isn't I mean, that in the sense of like it's just a substructure search. So you could say substructure right. search you, you, could do, you could do that, but yeah, we would just have four of those records rather than one record that says four things. Yeah. 
we for can, glorious belief. So the answer is, yeah. uh, I'm hoping we won't have to do it, but if we do have yeah. to do it, it, it just flows into into the data yep. structures we already have. It will just be a steeper sure. curve for parameterization. Where I'm thinking we may be, where, where I'm wondering if we're going to need it is when you think about the physics of polarizability, I'd be wor much more worried about um, anionic, like a, a carboxylate oxygen, which has all those extra electrons around it farther out in the valence you might imagine that that could polarize more mm -hmm. than a carbonyl oxygen or, or ether oxygen, which has also well, we, should, we should find well. out. We'll find out. Well, right? exactly. That's, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's yeah. the beautiful thing about the science here is and we'll be able to find... We only need atom-centric. I've only... Yeah, I, I, I'm sticking with the, the rest of the... with lore and legacy on that okay. one. All right. Yeah, but I mean, as, as opposed to off-center, you mean? Off-center, yeah. Yeah. I, you know... You'll obviously, if you put in more options, you'll get better fit in. Yeah. The question is, how do you know when you need yeah. it? Right. The plan here was to sort of do the stupidest, simplest thing yeah. possible and see yeah. how far that can get us. Right. Yeah. And, and in and fact, we have precedent to believe it will get us a long way. Right. And I think I think that in order just to get started, and maybe we'll see where Smirnoff is at that point. But I mean, you already essentially have atom typing that's typing that's used for VCCs. Yeah. And I think what we decided is that the first typing we'll do is just use your VCC types, assign polarizability yeah. based on those. Or, or even the epic ones. Like the, the, the ones with the jump ones with two shots. Yeah. Actually, dialogue. starting with epic might be a great idea. Yeah. So, or Apple Quiz. So he starts in April, it sounds like. April. Yes. Yes. Cool. That's yeah. important to know. So that's about it. So it would be very easy to put in support for polarizability. Into we should probably get that in on this yeah. revision of this good idea. Into yeah. putting support into the, the format, center. basically. Right. <clears throat> Just atom center. It's very very easy. Right, right now we're making some updates to the spec for the format, so it'd be a good time to put in what the spec will be. So you can expect right. us to right. ask a harass question. you slightly. Yeah. Yeah. I think let's have direct and and you know un yeah. and, and regular uncentered. <laughs> mutual, they call it mutual. <laughs> so, so are we ready to move on? I am. Okay. Michael three minutes. Okay. So now we're moving to the status updates. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.